Hello all and welcome to our now second of many um, Minnesota Office of the Higher Education Public Engagement Calls um, and what we are calling part one of two calls specifically focused on race and equity in higher education. Um, our next week call is going to be heavy on the student perspective. Um, as a reminder, these calls are meant to engage and inform uh, we structure these calls around the questions and comments we, we receive from you all, the public, while not open um, now, if time allows, we may open the chat box up for impromptu questions and hopefully address some questions related to this call that we have received via the Microsoft form um, that was sent out on the invitations. We have an amazing group of uh, speakers with us today. Um, I'd like to preface that um, their comments uh, will be coming from their personal perspectives and uh, not a representation of their institutions. Um, we have Brian, Dr. Brian Lanzinski, Associate Professor of Urban and Multicultural Education and Educational Studies uh, from McAllister College. Narita Hughes, Dean of Business, Technology, Career and Workforce Development at North Penn Community College. Andrea Dees, Interim Director for Diversity and Inclusion for Minnesota State. Dr. Robbie Burnett, Acting Director for the Center of Education Partnerships and Student Support Assistant Professor at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Um, prior to us getting into the actual discussion with the panelists, uh, because this is a topic regarding race in higher education, um, I would like to share some data and information um, as a basis for this conversation. Um, and this data is uh, regarding educational attainment, which refers to the highest level of education in individuals. Um, the data that I will be referring to is regarding um, certificates, associates, bachelor's, master's, or higher. Um, and it's for Minnesota. Minnesota set a educational attainment goal of 70% by 2025 for individuals aged 25 to 44 to obtain a certificate or higher. Currently, we are at 62%, and I will get into a little more about what that 62% actually is. Um, uh, it is important to understand why higher education, um, why higher education is important and why we're actually addressing it one, where the Office of Higher Education, but uh, why we're addressing it regarding race. Uh, higher education is a system, a system that, um, as you will hear the data, that hasn't um, actually been serving uh, BIPOC students very, very well in this state. Um, it is projected that 8 percent of hires paying family sustaining wage will require an education and training beyond high school. So the 62.2 percent, these are estimates from 2019, um, attainment rate for Minnesota. Within that, it is important to note that for American Indians, there's an attainment rate of 28 percent, and that has only increased by seven percentage points um, in the last five years. For Latinx communities, that percentage is 28.1 percent and has only increased five percent percentage points since 2015. And for black, the black community, the attainment rate is 37% um, and has only increased by three percentage points since 2015. And I say that because if we have an attainment goal, which is supposed to be met by 2025, um, that is 70% or higher, uh, these groups are being left behind essentially. I would like to also note that American Indians disproportionately have a 33.9% of total credentials held at, at the certificate only level. Um, for blacks, that's a 20.4%. And um, for our for the white community in Minnesota, that they own their credentials for certificate is only at 13%. So that means that their credentials are higher than a certificate. So like I said, this Proportionately, you see individuals of color, black and indigenous folk, obtaining mostly certificates and not those higher level degrees. Um, it is also important to note 
that disaggregation, and I think our panelists might talk on this a little bit um, within our discussion here, is extremely important when we're talking about these groups. Um, for example, the Asian overall attainment rate in Minnesota is currently at 64.2%. But when you desegregate, desegregate that data, the Asian Burmese uh, population is only at 3%. Hmong only at 37.1%. Korean and Chinese, however, are at 70 and 75%, and Asian Indians are at 90.9%. So uh, lumping everyone into one category skews the information um, and data we share, and it makes it difficult for us, for us to um, pinpoint where there are downfalls and where there are issues. Um, Another example is in the black category, when you disaggregate black Somali is actually at 8.8%. Black Liberians are actually at 5.8%. Latinx, Salvadorian is at 10.3% and Mexican is at 18.7% and Latinx Puerto Ricans are at 31.9%. So that is just some data I felt we should start this conversation off with. Um, and so we all have a basis to know that there are extreme um, shortfalls uh, by race within higher education and in attainment. So um, I will start, we have questions already set for the panel. And like I said, if we have time at the end, we will open up the chat uh, to allow for impromptu questions. Um, so the first question we have here for the panel is, data gives an account of Minnesota with a very low ranking, if not the lowest in the nation, regarding disparities experienced by BIPOC communities in obtaining post-secondary credentials. What are the missteps of higher education institutions and stakeholders in supporting BIPOC communities in retention, support, and graduation? Um, this is a two-part question. The second part is, how can these institutions and stakeholders be accountable in committing to the success of BIPOC communities in obtaining post-secondary credentials? So I will allow for either of the panelists to jump in um, and go from there. So this is Narita, I guess I'll kick us off here um, and then I can turn it over to someone else. Um, first and foremost, I think the biggest thing that you hit on, um, Nikki, was really the data. Um, that's one of the missteps that we and higher education institutions is we ideally look at it from a holistic measure, but um, rarely so, and up until recently, I would say, are we really just aggregating the data? Are we really digging in and looking at um, BIPOC communities and understanding what is causing um, a lack of retention, what is causing a lack of graduation and even completion um, for that matter. If you look at a lot of the higher education institutions and specifically, I'm, I'm gonna speak more from the public um, institutions since that's one of the um, institutions that I currently work at. Um, we are in a day and age where um, we are flip flops. So when you look at um, who your student population is, and then you look in relation to what um, what the who or who the instructors are, um, they do not align. Um, very similar to secondary, but there's no alignment there. And so we know that data proves that when you have some sense of um, belonging or some sense of connection, students are going to do um, a lot better than their white counterparts. So one of the missteps is really not necessarily digging into the uh, ethnic or racial divide that exists within higher education. And then I would say the other piece is looking at all the different facets and factors that BIPOC communities experience. Um, we you know, have double digits in some areas of unemployment. Um, so there's choices that have to be made where versus pursuing education, now you're looking at, I have a family to feed. Um, that could be why some are going to community colleges versus the four-year um, institutions. And then I would say the other piece is what resources. Uh, what resources are we offering our BIPOC community so that there is a sustainable measure as they enter into these institutions, then we're rallying around them or we're offering resources in order to help them complete um, you know, their educational attainment goal. And the third piece of that 
is you're finding more, and it kind of gets back to the first realm, is you're finding more that are attending uh, colleges and universities on a part-time basis. So if you're attending part-time, and then again, you have to make a decision, there's going to be a misstep and there's going to be um, skewed data, so to speak, and a cause for you not to either stay where you currently are or to continue where you currently are. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and pass it on to one of my other colleagues. Thanks. Um, I'll jump on. Um, uh, I, you know, I completely agree with everything um, that Narita is saying. You know, I think we have to. We it's imperative that we understand um, higher education as part of this broader ecosystem um, that really does look at um, the structural inequalities that have all that by the time young people reach the college level have already been embedded in the system, right? And so, so you know, one of the things we could look at are admissions processes and what are the, what are the actual metrics for admissions into our institutions of higher education and how do those metrics in and of themselves create, you know, maintain the structural inequality. So we've got um, young people coming up through the K-12 system and we can predict with incredible accuracy um, you know, who will be able to attain, um, who will be able to attain a college degree because colleges are signaling to K-12 institutions what kinds of students they are looking for, and then K-12 students are, are K-12 institutions are trying to mold those kinds of students. And so when we start to look at this from like a social and cultural emphasis, then it gets into well, what kinds of curriculum are being uh, are, are, are young people being exposed to? What kinds of uh, language and, and cultural processes are being structured as um, as competent for admission to our higher education institutions? And then once they get into higher ed, if they're able to uh, to matriculate, what's their what is their experience there? I know a lot of the students that I uh, work with uh, in at McAllister um, are you know they their their issues not academic in nature right they're highly competent highly capable it's the experience so that they're feeling marginalized in their classes they're feeling um, as though uh, you know the the professors that they're connected to um, are not are sympathetic or are not understanding of um, the 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 um, uh, issues that are coming up for them, whether they're financial issues, whether they're um, whether they're cultural issues, um, and also and then often feeling marginalized just in terms of, of being racially isolated or ethnically isolated once they get to campus, saying that I'm the often the only person in my class, you know, um, in my my uh, ethnic or racial group. Um, and, and so you know, I think part of this is understanding historically. The way these things have been constructed, these are not coincidences that just come out of, right? We have to be able to trace back 40, 50, 60 years to understand the kinds of disinvestment that BIPOC communities have been facing with regard to higher access to, to higher education, inclusion to higher education, and then return those kinds of investments. So until we do a full scale reckoning that isn't just about trying to make things um, make things equitable in in the current snapshot, but understanding that a historical disinvestment also needs to be calculated into whatever kinds of investments that we're making um, with regard to BIPOC communities. I'll, I'll stop there. Good morning. This is uh, Robbie Burnett. Thank you so much for Narita and Brian um, leading on the way to this conversation. I really just want to reiterate what both of them have already said around um, the his, history and the systems of higher education. And who was it initially really designed for, right? As we talk about who's actually in front of the students teaching them, what is the curriculum that they are actually learning? Um, what are the lived experiences that they are encountering not just only on campus, but as well as in the broader community of their college campus and experience. And so what's coming up for me is who's at the table who are having these um, conversations as well as the knowledge and the um, producers of knowledge and these decision makers who are at the table. 
So if, if, if BIPOC individuals are not at the table, they don't have agency, influence, or authority, then it just continues to come be rhetoric um, around uh, anti-racist education or anti-racist language that has really been um, centered under the white gaze. When we don't have multiple racial perspectives at the table, when we are making decisions, when we are talking about investment. And so it, it, it stems to, um, it starts with the history and the systems as well as the language that we're using. Um, who are these uh, authorities or these people around the table? Who are they seeking knowledge from, right? How are they seeking out getting knowledge from practitioners or scholars and or um, community activists from BIPOC communities as they're trying to shape what it is that they want to um, communicate in their messaging as a response when they are not really actually tapping into the communities that have that lived experience, that agency, as well as that social capital. So um, those are just some of my initial thoughts around the missteps at a structural level because it's designed to do exactly what it's that is doing, right? It's designed to do um, damage and harm to BIPOC because it wasn't designed for BIPOC. So I'll stop there. Good morning. I want to say thank you to my colleagues that have spoken before. They are, have really set a wonderful stage. And I want to just uh, uh, piggyback off of Dr. Burnett's perspective around the institutional response. And really looking at the fact that we really need to take a hold of these discussions in that broader strategic work within higher education. Because if this work isn't within the institution strategy, it will just be continued to see as an appendage. You know, we need to make sure that, as, I, as many have already said, that yes, we have to be at the table, but the, the sphere and the, of influence and the lens of which we're having these conversations has to really be broader in perspective. You really need to look at, yes, a, a person's experience, particularly leaders, there even may be um, multi-layered and intersectional perspectives that don't really, uh, that can mask the undertones of what needs to be said about supporting uh, our BIPOC community. And so when we talk about we're really getting into uh, paying attention to the needs of our communities and our students of color, we want to take the time to understand really what is going on in the community. Connect with the students on the everyday level. Do not make assumptions about a student's circumstances. I love what was said about the fact that we know that these students have, are brilliant, are excellent, and assume that. Make sure that you are walking into a space, whether you're a faculty member or in the business office, or whatever role you have in higher education, do not look at a student as a deficit. A student is an asset to our community, and particularly our students of color, because they are bringing such a broad, diverse perspective uh, that we really don't take advantage of and we don't really embrace um, in our everyday. So it's important for us to get to that deeper level of understanding our students at that everyday level, just not make assumptions about a student's circumstances. I'm, I'm, I'm taken back, and it's interesting that 11 years ago, uh, Chichimanda Ngozi um, Adiche really talked about in her, in her TED talk about the danger of a single story. And that still is relevant today, and it's even more so in, in the space that we're in now, because if you make assumptions about where people, how people come into the space, you know, if your sphere of influence or your sphere of understanding is, is narrow, then you're really not going to be able to get into um, how we can institutionally make a difference. And I think Minnesota tends to think, well, we are very, very open and wonderful. And, and, and yes, the door may be open, but the door is kind of halfway open. I mean, we're still talking about open the door, Richard. Come on now. I need you all to open the door completely and be responsive to all of the communities that we are serving. So with that in mind, I, I will stop there because I know we've got some, some wonderful uh, context of which we can uh, move forward with some of these other questions as we dig deeper in this discussion. 
Yes, thank you all. Um, the next question is actually related to COVID, the COVID crisis currently. Um, and I think it speaks to a lot of the things you all have already stated and given opinions on how to combat some of the issues we're seeing in, in higher ed or uh, addressing or just raising what some of those issues are. Uh, the question is, COVID-19 has exacerbated inequities experienced by BIPOC communities. Um, could you share what burdens students have experienced um, what conversations do higher education institutions and stakeholders need to have in order to change outdated practices that harm BIPOC communities, especially during um, COVID-19? I can go ahead and start. I think one of the, the big issues that um, really just um, unmasked uh, a lot of our uh, vulnerabilities was moving into an online space. We weren't ready for prison time. We weren't ready at all. Um, it was too quick for many folks. And, and what's interesting is that the online space has been around for well over 20, 25 years, almost 30. But, and, and what's more interesting is that we as higher edu higher ed institutions quite frankly, have been a little scared to get into that space and to understand. But what's interesting is that most of the people that are being served in, in those online spaces are people of color. So we need to come, reconcile the fact that this that online learning is here to stay. And we have to address it holistically. We have to be ready to talk about the digital divide and why, yes, while we may have a lot of a lot of uh, our BIPOC community engaged in those spaces. We as a, and I'm speaking from a, from a public university perspective, we should really be the ones that are at the forefront um, providing that service, providing that, that space. Because what, in, what has ended up happening is that we have made assumptions about what is needed from a higher education perspective without really taking a look at what is happening. And I, I, this is my theme, what's happening with the everyday? And so um, here lies a great opportunity for us to, one, look at the populations that we're serving um, in, in a wide scope of identities, including our adult learners, who, by the way, are not non-traditional students. They are students. They are here in that space, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Hughes, has talked about. We have many students that are in a space where they are working, they are going part-time. So when we're trying to collect data, we're not going to, that may be a voice that's missing because quite frankly, it's, it's the um, opportunity for us to really look at how to engage in that space. So COVID-19 has really unmasked a lot of our vulnerabilities and we need to really think about how to take these vulnerabilities and make them assets within the higher education community so that we really are supporting our BIPOC communities. I'll jump in here, um, echo, absolutely. So this is Marita again, because I know there's some people on the phone, uh, but I will absolutely echo what um, Andrea had said as far as not being prepared and not being ready for that online space. Um, in my world, and specifically, I can speak from my program, so to speak, um, because I'm business technology and career and workforce, um, some of our classes or majority of our classes have moved into that online space. So that's not new. But however, what is new is the fact that what we did not plan on is access and opportunity. And I look at, um, some of our students are not, as Andrea said, they're not your traditional age students. So they're not that 17 to 21 year old. They are probably more of that um, 24 to 35 year old. And so now you tack on, not only do I have to, you know, be in this online space for myself, but now I have to navigate online space or distant learning for my child. And so what we would run into and have run into as far as the inequities is access to technology. I can look at my dining room table who has turned into now my office and I have probably about five different devices 
I have that access to be able to do that. Our students, however, do not. So I do know that that was a huge inequity where our students are now trying to share one device in a family of five or a family of four, or even in some cases, a family of eight. So that was a, another inequity that we experienced for the BIPOC community. The other thing that I'll add, another hat that I wear um, is, you know, with the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. And we recently, as of yesterday, had Commissioner Malcolm, um, and we talked about COVID. One of the other aspects and that really impact BIPOC communities is when you look at hospitality, when you look at healthcare, and when you look at the service industry, guess who is working in those industries? BIPOC communities. So now, not only do I have to put my uh, myself at risk, I'm putting my family at risk, and I'm still trying to get an education. So those were some of the things that really impacted um, how COVID um, has affected the family, but then also how it impacted the schooling. And I think one of the things that you know higher education institutions were not ready for. It's easy to say, well, throw every throw everything online, but we also have to recognize, and Andrea said this as well. Not everybody's an online learner. So what resources do we have, not just for the student, but what resources did we even have for our faculty and staff? Were they even prepared to make that shift to an online platform or a virtual platform where now I can't meet you face to face, but I have to do it virtually. I may not understand how to navigate that. So it, um, in essence, was a learning curve holistically. So it wasn't just for the student, but it was also for um, you know, the faculty, staff, and others that this is not a space that they are used to. And then when you look at um, the cost, so what we don't really talk about is, as we know in higher education, face-to-face -face classes are cheaper than an online class. So now we have that aspect, and granted, yes, there was some tuition differentials, and there's some other aspects that we try to save costs and not try to, um, you know, do a price a ticket um, increase rather, but I think the other thing is to notice that. So then as we're moving into fall, we're kind of pushing them in almost that same direction. So again, the inequities are gonna continue until we can come up with resources and hone in on our stakeholders to be able to help us with that. So I'll stop there and move it on to another colleague. <laughs> You know, I think, and I, again, I, I definitely um, agree with everything um, my colleagues have said here, and certainly can can convey some of the experiences of of the students that I've had with regard to like you know being in class on their phone in in a car, um, you know, as the, because too much too many things are happening in the home at a certain point um, versus just you know having access, having students just you know fall off the map. And not knowing where they are, if they're okay, you know, those kind of things um, certainly popped up. But you know, I think one of the things that I, I really want to um, highlight is what what COVID has, I think, illustrated. Once, I mean, we could talk about, you know, that we weren't prepared, and, and I think we certainly agree um, that you know, definitely we're not prepared for for moving online. But what it did illustrate was the speed at which um, uh, the speed at which our institutions were able to make shifts, major shifts. So in a period of two weeks, we saw campuses moving from entirely in person to entirely online and seemingly providing all of the necessary infrastructure to be able to do those things, right? And yet, when we talk about the, the the health pandemic of racial inequality, which is a health pandemic, right? People, BIPOC, BIPOC communities are dying at higher rates than other com than white communities, right? This is a this is this is empirically uh, 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 true, right? So if we don't approach um, racial injustice as a health pandemic, um, then when we look at all the all the decisions being made around COVID and understand that COVID is a health pandemic happening inside of a larger health pandemic, right? And so it's it's imperative for us to understand um, what does that mean for our particular communities when um, 
um, when we're, we're faced with this question of well, what does it mean to pursue an education at the risk of your own health and your own life? Um, interestingly, you know, my, my scholarship is in uh, African-American educational history, and that question has, is not a new question, right? Black folks have been contending with getting an education at the risk of our own health for generations, you know, um, and we can, we can look back to the anti-literacy laws um, that, you know, that, that uh, you know, illustrated uh, or had uh, threats of death and threats of corporal punishment for simply learning how to read, you know, this dating back to, to the 1800s, right, and, and before. And so this question of what does it mean to pursue an education at the risk of your own health, this is why and going back to something I think Andrew mentioned, that this is why it's important to have students of color on our campuses and faculty of color on our campuses because we have already addressed these issues of what kind of it, what is it worth? And it, it speaks to our, the greater purpose of our institution. If our institutions are embedded in the status quo and are about simply providing access for BIPOC communities to the status quo, then the, the inequality is just going to simply perpetuate. But if our institutions are invested in a transformational kind of justice at the core, that's what will actually have an impact on the communities. And you'll start to see the racial injustices in our institutions begin to change because the mission of the institution is literally to address those injustices, not simply to have you know, a, a different color rainbow perpetuating the same kinds of uh, the same kind of society that got us into this mess in the first place. And so I think it's really important for, for us to understand that COVID is a key moment in time where we can make large structural shifts because we already have. If anything, it's shown us that the will to make those changes is only greater than the will not to make those changes. And we've already decided that due to COVID, we're going to make large structural changes. Can we make the same investment due to, due to structural racism? I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Lezinski. So um, I know our third question is uh, for you all to talk about some success stories you've heard from um, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color students, faculty in higher education. But before I go to that question, there was a question that we got um, through our form that I think uh, is a appropriate to ask you all now, especially given this current um, question we were, we were referencing um, and some of the stuff you uh, just mentioned here. So given the disruption occurring during the COVID-19 pandemic, what realistic opportunities do you see for making significant changes for higher education to support today's students? And what resources or decisions need to be made at which level for example, classroom institution systems, state renewal credit or federal uh, to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, and for you all, I will also put this in the chat so you can see it because I know it's kind of a lot. Um, but essentially, it's. I think they're saying we're at an opportunity because of this di disruption and what opportunities do you think are realistic that can where we can implement some changes that would support uh, the BIPOC students. So this is Andrielle Dees again. Um, I, I guess I can start off by talking about the fact that we have what what we have what we are dealing with right now um, that shock to the system the shock to the higher education system you know I, I have said for many years that there was we were sitting in a bubble um, that was eventually going to have to uh, come to terms with who we are as a system as a as a high, as a provider of higher education and this is across the board nationwide. And what has ended up happening, I mean, similar to, I would say, uh, 15, 20 years ago with the tech bubble, when it burst, all of a sudden, 
we're we're sitting with uh, institutions and systems that have have to be completely dismantled and and worked uh, worked up again. And so, what we're dealing with now is looking at this intersectionality around um, and needing to come to terms around the fact that you know what students are starting to say, you know what, I'm going to own my way to get through higher education. No, I am not going to pay, you know, extraordinary amounts and go into extraordinary amounts of debt uh, for the sake of, of getting this degree. I need to really think about what it is, you know, that I'm going to do. Because in, in past situations, most higher education institutions have been able to be, uh, to be supportive within it, times of distress, times of economic crisis. People would say, oh, I will go back to school and retrain and retool. That's not necessarily the case anymore because we're in a different time. We're in a different time frame. And the amount it costs for uh, uh, for students to gain an education, even even in our even if in our in our situation where we have um, some cost effective educational opportunities, it still is a significant battle. And we need to come to terms right now with how we are going to not fund people at the end. And, and I think it's wonderful from a philanthropic perspective of getting a student through school and saying, by the way, we're going to uh, you know, forgive your loans. What about at the very beginning? How, how can we make sure that we are being more cost effective in our uh, in our work here with higher education institutions, so students aren't having to to step in and step out. They can actually make the affordability work for them. We are more concerned about how we're, you know, about other pieces of that puzzle. And that I think we need has this has caused us to really flip and take a strong look institutionally at how we're really going to be a good, strong higher education provider quality at an affordable perspective, because otherwise we're going to continue to see uh, colleges uh, do some significant changes, if not get to the point of closing. So that's just my, my perspective. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel? Any um, ideas about what resources or decisions need to be made um, and at which level? Yeah, uh, so this is Nuria. I'll, I'll jump in on here. Um, one of the things that I'll say that what COVID has caused us to do is to recognize that there are um, alternative measures of how we look at our programs. And what I mean by that is courses or programs that we thought were only a face-to-face -face class um, or face-to-face -face program has now caused us to think outside of the box or to think that there are no boxes and what I would say radical imagination, um, what's possible that we thought was impossible. And so there are also some policies at, I would say, a twofold level at an institution level that we need to relook at and also a system level that we need to relook at that can that we can make some changes that won't cause us to be stagnant or cause us to feel like we're you know making decisions in a bubble and not that we did do that because I think it was a learn as you go. Um, I always use the analogy, it's not a great analogy, but it's kind of how COVID was for, you know, us across the state and even, you know, United States in general is building the plane while you're flying, <laughs> you know, so um, I would say that that it, it caused for opportunities for us to relook at how we're teaching, what we're teaching, um, what learning outcomes that we're expecting, but then also from a institution-wide perspective and a system-wide perspective, um, what policies do we need to put in place or what policies were in place that caused structural barriers or institution-wide barriers? And so re-looking at those and even from an accreditation perspective, um, are there areas that we now can enhance um, be, because of COVID. And so now we have to look at things differently. So those would be my, my quick pieces to that question. 
Thank you so much, Narita. This is Robbie. Um, just in the spirit of your uh, comment around radical re reimagination, um, that was what was coming up for me as well. Um, as we think about COVID-19, the opportunity to reimagine. And so three, three areas that are coming up for me is number one, our governing body, specifically our, our unions regarding our faculty, right? Because they are the ones that are undergirding the curriculum, the instruction, and partially some of the actual experiences that our students experience or encounter on our campuses. So reimagining um, radically, like what does, um, hiring look like for trying to increase the number of faculty of color or from BIPOC communities because we know that having faculty who mirror or represent the population of students is a retention strategy that leads to persistence and graduation. So in addition to um, that, unions also have a stronghold on the type of curriculum that's being taught in the courses to our students. And so that also gets to um, pro programmatic policies and admission policies and uh, systemic things that are in place that um, some of our faculty and these unions have a lot of power over. If we're talking about reimagining in the spirit of COVID how we're going to be delivering instruction or reimagining what does anti-racist leadership and anti-racist education look like on college campuses in Minnesota. Um, the second thing that came up for me is um, a lot of our students, as a lot of our colleagues on the panel have already stated, they are, um, they're earning and learning. They have become essential workers. So how and in what ways can we have conversations with industry and think about what does partnership look like in a different way to meet the needs of um, our, our students who are essential workers, but as well as having conversations about what are the new skills and, and um, expertise that industry is saying that they need for individuals graduating from our programs, entering into the workforce, what type of skills and expertise do they need? That's going to be a part of a little bit of a paradigm shift because that means that we need to be really listening to the concerns and ideas of these stakeholders and taking action on them. Um, the third piece I, I feel is collaboration across institutions whether they're mint state, two-year, four-year, whether they're public, private, we need to be thinking more collaboratively because in the era of COVID, as we think about financial resources, those are only going to continue to diminish, right? And so we're going to be all going for the same pot of money in, in a competition rather than why, how can we be working more in cooperation and collaborating more and thinking about how can we be co-investing, how can we be co-leading, how can we be co-constructing together, because the pot of money is only going to continue to get smaller. So those are three points that came up for me as we think about how can we reimagine what um, higher education looks like in the times of COVID-19. Yeah, I really do love um, Dr. Burnett's last uh, last. I mean, all of her, all of her points, but especially this last point around collectivity versus competition. I think it's imperative that we get rid of the ethos of competition in higher education. Um, that that because the, the the issue is whenever you have competition, you have you automatically set up a, a structure of winners and losers, and we know that um, when we talk about racial equity, and I, I take this from. Uh, Sociologist Dorothy Roberts, she, she says race doesn't doesn't use other tools to predict. Race is the predictive tool, right? So race will tell you about the winners and losers because that's the purpose of race. <laughs> like there's no other, literally no other purpose <laughs> of of these of these backward categorizations that we use for um, to put people in these in these unnecessary boxes. I just want to highlight a few other things that I think have already been happening. So one, um, you know, my institution, uh, McAllister College, uh, several weeks after, um, after we closed our campus due to COVID, uh, we, we uh, made um, our school test optional in terms of admissions. And so we know that the racial inequality baked into um, the college board and the testing structures, which are which are more predictive of family income than they are of degree attainment, um, those need to go by the wayside. Uh, and I think that will uh, 
do some work in terms of equaling the playing field of access to our higher ed institutions. Uh, so we need so the, the whole notion that that uh, colleges across the country have just been waiving the ACT and SAT requirements for admissions, I think, is um, is as an excellent example of what needs to continue. Um, I want to hold up Augsburg. Um, within a month of uh, the the murder of George Floyd, they created a George Floyd scholarship fund for students um, and also created a critical race and ethnic studies department are in the process of creating that and have uh, and have been, uh, pledged to invest in a cluster higher faculty of color. Right. And this is all within a month. And so, again, the, you know, it's. We can't fall back on the logic that that this is going to take some absurd amount of time. Uh, you know, like James Baldwin says, right? You know, how much time is it going to take for for your progress to happen? Right? These are things that could be decisions that could be made immediately. We need to start to question the financial investments of our institutions um, and thinking about where is tuition actually going? Right? Uh, faculty are often blamed. For uh, for higher tuition costs, when in the reality we're seeing more and more adjunct faculty being hired, uh, faculty are not receiving uh, you know exorbitant amounts of of salaries. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, salaries are often going to the higher end uh, to to additional administrative positions, um, and then and and you know with COVID, I think we're starting to even see more of that. We're going to start to see more. Administrators specifically there for COVID and all these other kinds of things um, when we should be questioning some of those decisions and thinking about how can uh, tuition dollars. Be more equally invested uh, within and across institutions and also looking at our financially um, well off institutions and thinking about those. Um, uh, endowments and all of the other kind of things and the financial. Um, the financial infrastructure it takes to manage endowments, which ironically can't even be used to address emergencies like COVID because they're they're not able to be drawn from. And so thinking about uh, kind of this wealth hoarding that we see from some of our more financially wealthy institutions, I think uh, is something we also need to question with regard to um, the, the the cost of higher education. Thank you, thank you all. Um, and that you 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 keep ending on uh, good points that help me segue into the next question. Um, and you've touched on Dr. Lazinski, you touched on this a little bit with some of your examples. But uh, what are some success stories of Black, Indigenous, people of color, students, faculty, and higher education staff at your institutions that need to be lifted up, celebrated, and possibly re replicated? I can I, I can give a couple quick ones. I mean, I really I, I do think we we can um, lift up a lot of the work that our young people have been doing in terms of um, just on the street activism. You know, I think when you look out and see some of the the protests that are happening, many of them uh, specifically around the um, police violence, um, many of them have been organized by. Uh, our local college students um, and, and by POC college students. And so they're again putting their lives on the line for something that they realize will serve a greater purpose. And, 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 and I wish our institutions would have the courage of these young people to, to actually put our, you know, put, put some skin in the game, right? Put, our, put the money where our mouth is. We want to talk a good racial equity game. But when it comes time to be on the front lines, you know, we see our young people there, um, but our institutions there backing them. Uh, I would also highlight again um, the creation of uh, entities like critical race and, and ethnic studies departments at our institutions that are literally experts in studying racial disparity. Right? We have whole fields <laughs> that exist to understand these things, and that these. Every institution should have an, a discipline to study on a meta level the, the kinds of disparities that we're seeing and then to be able not to just do it like just in an academic sense, but to be able to be transformative in terms of, um, you know, helping to shift policy. Um, and so I would, I would hold up the ethnic studies programs. I would hold up 
um, you know, faculty all across the state who have been um, uh, writing and who have been, uh, you know, changing curriculum. There, there are entirely new classes that are popping up that are um, really dealing with the day-to-day -day experiences of, of, uh, of young people. And this is what uh, I think um, by PLC communities are asking for is to, is to, you know, reckon with the day-to-day -day reality of both COVID and racial violence. And I'll jump in, this is Nuria again. Um, one of the things that our institution is doing and has done since we recently hired a new um, ABP for diversity and inclusion is we're having racial healing circles um, so that you're able to talk about, you know, how you're really doing, but then also elevating the discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion and how that impacts BIPOC communities um, across the board. So whether it's the student, whether it's the faculty, whether it's staff or administration, um, that's one thing that we're doing. Um, we also are looking into, um, and we don't have all the logistics, but we're um, getting a scholarship together as a result of the murder of George Floyd. So those are one of the things, um, another thing that we're doing. Um, I would say the third thing that we're doing is, um, it's our stakeholders and who we're actually reaching out to. We're being very intentional about reaching out to those that have a vested interest in hiring um, our BIPOC, you know, population. And so we recently have um, launched a workforce innovation and experiential learning center and connecting with business and industry that is looking to diversify, you know, their work, their workplace and being able to use that center as a bridge, so to speak, so that they're able to recruit directly from our institution. So those are three things that we're doing as far as elevating and success stories that could be replicated. So this is Andrea Aldiz again, and I, I want to just uh, uh, highlight from a, from a system perspective, the fact that um, right in the midst of this, of all of the uh, surrealness that is occurring, you know, our office was uh, really well, uh, well set and did a wonderful job with um, just introducing the concept of equity by design for the whole system. Um, the team that I worked on, work with, did an amazing job of kicking off uh, this work just a few months, a few weeks ago, uh, with uh, an extremely um, um, exciting audience of about 400 uh, colleagues throughout Minnesota State. And this is going to be work that's not going to be uh, a flash pan. This is work that is going to really dig deep and provide a sustainable work and hopefully transformational change within all of our institutions within Minnesota State. And I'm really proud of my colleagues for taking the time to do the heavy lifting, to do the work. Um, you know, they have uh, come through uh, just amazingly strong and the work will continue. We will continue to support our institutions that have um, decided to take this work and move it forward. Um, wonderfully enough, it is all blanketed by the strategic work that um, is setting the, setting the stage with Equity 2030. So I'm really excited to be in this space right now uh, here in, in Minnesota because in Minnesota State because I feel like we are in a good spot where we can actually uh, start speaking into this work, uh, not just from what I would call the flash pan, it's, it's good for right now, but really looking at it from a sustainability perspective as well. So these, this, these are things that, you know, it will take time. It's not going to be um, a, uh, a one-time shot. These, this is strong work. This is heavy lifting that each of our institutions, if they commit, and they have committed, need to move forward and continue to, to do the work even when the uh, the headlines die down. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Director Dees. I just want to, before I allow anyone else to speak on this question, uh, to say that I know from, in, even though he's not able to speak here, I would say I know that our agency and our commissioner is also committed to supporting that work that you all are doing at Men's State um, as best we could. So um, I don't know if Dr. Burnett or uh, I think Narita already spoke, has any um, anything to add to this question about uplifting um, faculty, staff, or things in your institution that should be celebrated or replicated? Sure, thank you, Nikki. Um, I think I'll just start by just uh, stating that I come from um, the teacher education perspective. And so within our College of Education, we have been on our racial justice and equity journey for about the last four to five years, um, starting with revising our mission and vision of the College of Education um, that is grounded in racial justice and equity work as we are preparing professionals to go out into K-12 spaces, whether they are um, educational leaders, teachers, counselors, what have you. And so this has been something that um, our college specifically has been taking up this work for a while now. And so just given COVID-19 as well as, you know, the unrest, um, the global movement around racial justice and police brutality, we have been on our journey um, seeking to interrupt and disrupt the traditional thinking as well as the traditional ways in which we have been preparing teacher candidates to go into classrooms. Um, right before, excuse me, um, we have also been engaged in a network improvement community with um, Michigan State University's College of Education as well as California State Dominguez Hills College of Education where we've come together as three teacher preparation programs in an effort to transform our teacher ed programs so that they are grounded in racial justice and equity. Um, right before COVID hit or in the midst of COVID, um, we actually developed a survey with the University of Southern California's Race and Equity Center um, directed by Dr. Sean Harper to survey both of our faculty and our teacher candidates, our students around um, what they are experiencing in all three of our programs regarding uh, racial justice, equity, critical race theory, uh, racial literacy. So really trying to take a pulse of what we have done so far. How is that translating and transcending into the development of our teacher candidates as well as what is the support that our faculty who are teaching these teacher candidates, what is the support that they need? And so again, our, our goal and our purpose is to really transform our teacher prep program so that um, racial justice and equity is baked into our programs and that we are preparing racially conscious teacher candidates, uh, racially conscious leaders, racially conscious counselors to go into um, schools to create racially just environments. So really, it has just really heightened our work and it's also affirmed us that we have been on the right journey and we're on the right trajectory. Um, but as we continue to, you know, continue to interrupt and disrupt inequities as well as decentering whiteness and really trying to uproot um, whiteness by replacing and replanting seeds of racial justice and, and equity. And so that is just something that we've been doing within our college at MSU Mankato as it relates to this work. Thank you all. So um, that was it from the set questions we had for you all. There are some questions, some additional questions we got submitted via the form previously before this call started. Um, so I'm gonna ask those and then I think we, I think this call is meant to be all the way until 1130. So I think we'll have time to open up um, for chat and impromptu questions for folks that are on um, online, if if you're on the phone and have access to the internet, you can also submit questions still via the, the form. Um, if, if you can't access this, what I can uh, ask questions via the chat. Um, so one of the questions that we have on our form is how you to conduct an equity audit to measure racial climate on campus. And if not, what can OHE do to incentivize this? Incentivize this? 
And I'm not fully aware that that the systems are required to do a racial audit to measure campus climate. Um, I'm assuming, and I believe that that is a part of the Equity 2030 uh, initiative. But um, I don't know if you all have some just to that, and if there is something out there, how could our agency, I guess, help? Uh, uh, that or incentivize uh, institutions to participate in that work. So this is Andrea Ldees again, and um, you're, you are correct. I don't know if there's a mandate, but I will say in terms of the toolbox that we've created, uh, for uh, Minnesota State Systems and would be happy to really collaborate with our partners in higher education, with OHI, with our private partners in edu education. I agree with, with what has been said about the opportunity to collaborate. These are, these are uh, opportunities that we can definitely provide some work. We are doing uh, work with respect and providing tools consultation and guidance around issues as it relates to campus climate. Um, and that, that, is, um, th that has some embeddedness within equity by design, but it, it is within itself its own uh, work that many of our campuses are undertaking. So, um, and that includes a racial component. That includes specifically and intentionally looking at issues around race and equity. So um, yes, that, that is happening. Um, it would be wonderful to have that normalized within our, our structures. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is a great time for us to really think about how to really change the paradigm of making it something that's a nice to have and making it something that's just structurally within all of our systems and, and processes. I, Thank you. I, um, I didn't yeah, know. Oh, sorry, go this ahead. Is, this is Brian. Um, you know, I, I do think this is an incredibly important question. And and like Andrea said, you know, I think, I'm, again, I'm I'm not aware of any kind of mandate. And that I think that's part of the problem is that we don't, right? And so we depend on institutions. And, and there is there's no institution that doesn't have uh, an equity platform, a racial justice mission statement, you know, all of these kind of things. Um, and yet when it comes down to what are the accountability structures for those mission statements, for those promises, we're, we're sorely lacking. And so, you know, I'm thinking about what would it mean for the accreditation of an institution to depend on its racial equity outcomes, not as promises, but as outcomes, right? And how could we work better to, with the accrediting bodies to actually say, your, your institution would risk its accreditation if you don't address the racial disparities that are happening at every level, right? And, and, and see what kind of promise, what kind of changes might be made if, if there was really an accountability structure that wasn't just about rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the next question is, what has the state, and I think some of this has been talked about as one of the issues, um, but what has the state done to invest resources in providing high quality opportunities for students of color um, rather than using race neutral higher education funding formulas? Um, yeah. And if you all don't have an answer for this, this is something that um, from a, a executive branch agency perspective uh, that we are working on, uh, this is one of those things I know with our current administration and current leadership that is where, like you said, we are trying to embed equity in the work we're doing and reform some of these programs that have been around for forever. Um, and reevaluate, are they serving and doing what 
not what they always were intended to do because as, as you all have stated, this system was not created to serve this population of individuals. So, but what we want it to do. So um, that is something our agency is always looking at, um, especially with our current leadership, like I said, with Commissioner Olson and Deputy Commissioner Sullivan and Governor Walls. Um, and I could, I will work on compiling some additional information about what some of those resources exactly are um, and some of those changes for um, our call next week for the public to know. Um, but I don't know if you all know any specific things within your institutions where uh, resources are being invested and provide high quality opportunities for these students. I hate to be the one talking all the time, <laughs> but I can I can briefly say this is Andrea Aldez again that um, yeah at Minnesota State we do have uh, opportunities for each of our institutions to participate in the Access Opportunity and Success Initiative, and this is uh, money that is really put aside uh, to support the recruitment and retention of underrepresented students within our uh, system. So that is something that has been in place. One of the things that we are elevating is the need for us to ensure um, some accountability in that space. Uh, and I think that that just gives us even more uh, of a platform of which we can ensure that uh, we are looking at those outcomes appropriately and ensuring that uh, the, these types of resources definitely uh, get put into the, uh, the, the type of programming or initiatives that will actually pro provide a real accountability outcomes that uh, where we are seeing a, any kind of significant um, a move towards reducing gaps with respect to uh, our students' Uh, retention and graduation rate. So that is uh, definitely something that is in place uh, within Minnesota State. Thank you. I don't know, does Ian, uh, Narita or Dr. Burnett have anything to add? Yeah, you know what, I will. So this is Narita. So one of the things um, I'll kind of piggyback on what um, Andrea had said. We have used that at our institution, and we've actually created what's called a HOPE program, um, which really is targeted for our BIPOC students in order for them to be successful in providing a mentorship along with leadership opportunities. So we've kind of turned those dollars and used some of them, not the whole thing, but some of them, um, you know, as one of the initiatives is to increase retention um, and persistence for our BIPOC community. So based off of what Andrea was saying, that's how we've used the access and opportunity dollars at our institution. Thank you all. And I think we're gonna um, open the chat up, but before we do that, I want to allow you all the opportunity, if there's anything you want faculty, students, parents to know about kind of a call to action, things they could be doing, not just the students, obviously, but faculty, staff, institutions, society, the community. Um, if there's anything you, you want to leave on, uh, I'm, I'm trying to open it up to give you that opportunity before we start allowing for impromptu questions. This is Robert Burnett right now. Um, I think I just would like to invite and challenge our attendees to recognize and understand that racial justice and equity work is personal wellness work. And it starts with the individual. And I just want to invite each and everyone on the call to just start having conversations and um, doing some readings, like stepping outside of your comfort level, because systems are made up of people and the work that we are trying to do is um, it's heart and soul work and it's personal wellness work. And so encouraging and challenging and inviting folks to, you know, step out of your comfort zone, start having conversations um, courageously, start, um, you know, thinking about who are you following on social media? 
who, who, what kind of professional development books are you reading? How many, how many scholars of color or people of color are authors of um, your reading materials or your professional development or who you're following on social media? I think it just starts with the individual. And so I just welcome people to just, um, you know, step into the work because it's a collective and we need everyone um, because we're better together. And so I just, I guess that's my call to action. Uh, this is Nareen, and I'm going to piggyback on something that Robbie had said that it really does, um, it really does start individualized. It starts with you. Your journey begins with you. Step outside of your comfort zone. Um, I, I have a saying where I say, get comfortable being uncomfortable. So lean in to what's uncomfortable and really kind of unpack that. Uh, we know that people drive change. We lead change and we also sustain change, but it's also stepping outside of yourself and having that conversation. Um, race, place, and space is something that, as a person of color, I live it every day. But somebody that is not of color, they, they can never walk in my shoes. They can never understand um, what it feels like to be um, a woman and a black woman at that. And so I think being able to lean into those, we know that there is institutionalized and structural barriers that exist, start breaking those barriers down. Be a disruptor in your organization, but, but not to a point that it's going to cost you your job. But I would just say realistically, you know, lean into that and disrupt where you know you can be the disruptor, especially if you're a decision maker. I would just add, um, you know, I think the, the, the journey is certainly a personal journey, um, but it also becomes that much more effective when we can join with other people. And so I would, I would encourage everyone to be part of an organization that fits with your values and fits with your, um, with your vision. And so, you know, thinking about what, what, what organizations are we a part of? How do we build our power collectively? Um, and, and knowing that our institutions are not going to just change of, of their own will. I think, you know, we, we've seen that. Um, and so it, it is going to take outside agitation. It is going to take uh, the ability to lobby um, for, for policies. And so thinking about these things, you know, these structural issues are going to have to be solved at a structural level. It's going to have to come down to where is time and money being invested and how can institutions be forced, not asked politely, but forced to make justice-based decisions in, um, in terms of admissions, in terms of the experience, in terms of finances of students, uh, you know, all of these, all of these pieces. Um, and so, and, 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 and that's only going to come through co organized collectives of people. So my question would be, what organization are you part of? This is Andrielle Dees again. Um, I would uh, recommend that we continue to ask those hard questions and hold us accountable and don't be afraid to, to do that. I mean, the beautiful thing that has occurred in, in 2020 has been uh, the elevation of being outspoken. And the good news is that hopefully people are really listening and that we have to find a way to make sure that the, the voice is sustained, that the accountability is sustained. Um, that that the that all of this work is not all for naught, and that we're back in 2021 in our comfort zone. I think Dr. Burnett said it best about getting out of your comfort zone and, and making sure that um, you know the the structures that are that are seeking to make sure that you are getting what you need to be successful are really doing it in a way that's going to value you and not just value the system of which we are, are working under. And so that, that, I think, is really going to be really key mo moving forward, is to understand that individual value, to understand each of us as, as, uh, as, as, a, as a piece of this puzzle, because we're, we're not here to pontificate and listen to ourselves. We're here to really be, make sure that that our students, however you come into our space, that you come out being the beautiful, 
person, people that you are and have elevated your critical thinking and have elevated to wherever you need to go and that we're helping to meet your needs at that, at that point. So uh, thank you all so much for, for uh, letting us bend your ear for a little while today. No, thank you all for um, participating and speaking and sharing your voice and your um, some suggestions and your opinions and points of views on on this topic and uh, your expert opinions. Um, the chat is open, so if there's questions um, for anybody uh, on the call, uh, you can submit them via the chat box. Um, our next call, um, like I said, this is like part one of part two. I uh, fully aware that we can't encompass and cover everything needed to be covered around race and equity in higher education in just two one one and a half hour calls. Um, but we are we really wanted to dedicate a space for this. Um, uh, so that's why we're having these two calls. Our intentions are to ingrain um, talking about race and, and equity uh, throughout future calls. But like I said that we, this is more, supposed to be public engagement and I know it's a closed call, but that's why we want individuals to submit form, questions, comments via the Microsoft form, via the email to the OHE public engagement at state.mn.us email account. So those help us shape these calls and gather the necessary people to be on the call to answer the questions, uh, to provide the information um, to the public. I don't think we've gotten any questions. So uh, just to let everyone know, one, I want to thank our panelists for participating on this call. This was recorded. Uh, you all will get an email with the recording and additional um, any references made here for links or web addresses or resources. Um, we'll also attach the data for attainment um, to that email. And then our next call, these are weekly, um, 10 a.m. every Wednesday. Um, so our next call, like I said, the panel will be primarily students. Um, and still the topic is on race and equity in higher education. Um, Excuse me, Nikki, we do have a couple questions coming into the chat. Cool, so um, I'll, I'll let Kat go ahead and you can go ahead and ask the question. Sure. So the, yeah. yeah, so the first question that we have is, um, do, does, do any of the panelists have specific recommendations for staff training, either activities, speakers, or interactive discussions? Um, this is Narita. Uh, yes, one of the um, activities that I would highly recommend is called the Five Circles. And I'm happy to like email that out to uh, Maya or whoever from OHE, uh, but it's five circles and the object of five circles is you identify yourself. So your name goes in the middle. You, how do you identify yourself um, within the five circles? Great activity for yourself and staff. Um, and then you start eliminating some of the circles. Depending upon the time, you can do one at a time until you're down to one. Um, and the whole point is, everybody is giving up a piece of themselves to be present at the table. And so it's a great way to understand what are people giving up in order to be present, um, specifically when it's dealing with equity and inclusion. Um, another one is a talking circle, um, heavily known in the Native community, um, where you open up real dialogue and then everybody goes around um, and, and is able to talk about, you know, what's on their mind and that, again, can lead into different discussion points as well. And I would say the third um, activity, if you have not done it, is the privilege walk. Um, and you have a series of questions and everybody actually takes a step forward. If it applies to you, if it doesn't apply to you, you take a step backward. But it also, again, allows you to see where is everybody's um, walk, but then where, where are they at as far as um, where privilege is concerned, again, when you're talking about race, place, and space. I think, uh, you know, there's been um, like a proliferation of webinars and um, trainings being offered across the country. Um, a couple that I will highlight 
are um, one of uh, uh, Kevin Kumashiro, who's an education, anti-oppressive education scholar, has been offering a series called Academic Step Up, uh, or Academics Need to Step Up, I believe. <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's been an ongoing series, I believe, uh, every couple of weeks. So if you look up Kevin Kumashiro, K-U-M-A-S-H-I-R-O. Um, there's also the Education for Liberation Network has been offering a series of, uh, of webinars um, dealing with everything from uh, uh, justice-based education during the COVID-19 pandemic to um, exploring police violence in schools. Um, I, I would also offer um, the Zen Education Project has had a powerful series of webinars, um, as well as Haymarket Books um, in, in terms of rethinking um, structural dilemmas in, in the ecosystem of education, both both K-12 and post-secondary. This is Rabbi. Um, I would just like to offer um, the idea of the creation of a critical whiteness study group or a critical whiteness group um, where it could be for faculty, staff, or um, whatever the stakeholders are but it's, a, it's an outlet where um, white folks can really come around and coalesce around the intellectual standpoint versus the, the personal standpoint and a way to process scenarios or a uh, model of space of interrogation of thinking just because um, white folks need to talk to white folks. That's a part of this work as well. So that's just one thing that I had to offer. Thank you all. Kat, was there additional questions? Yes, there were. Okay, so the next question is, in terms of public engagement, how do we engage with parents and the communities to support their call for higher, ed higher education transformation? So I'll read it again. In terms of public engagement, how do we engage with parents and the communities to support their call for higher ed transformation? Hi, this is Andrielle Bees again. So I think the um, one of the points that I, and I, I'm happy to reiterate it is, you know, we have to meet people where, where they are. And that means that we have to ensure that we are taking that time to, um, becoming part of the community uh, of which, you know, our parents are a part of, of which they're, they are um, giving over <laughs> their, uh, their, uh, their budding and adult, adult children and are, and are actually engaging not as just as parents, but also as learners at some point. And so I think it's important for us to note that, and I, I, I I think our community colleges and our, our universities and all of our institutions, I think are doing a great job in terms of understanding the communities that are, of which they are serving. And whether it is at the local level or the regional level or the national level, um, you know, really keeping a, a close ear to um, hearing where parents are at, where our students are at, and as they come into our spaces. So um, public engagement can take, you know, a variety of forms, but, you know, we should be doing doing almost a two-way street where, yes, let's, let's be the host and forms of different types of, um, of, of engagement opportunities, but let's also be a part of those community events and those community engagement opportunities. Uh, let's, one of the, the interesting things uh, that I think we can all take away from this time of being with COVID-19 is that all of a sudden we have had to stop and really start thinking about what is most important. And most, what's most important at the end of the day are, is about relationship building. Um, you know, Dr. Burnett made a really great comment about the fact that systems are made up of people. And if we don't connect with the people, our systems are, are 
but just going to continue to not serve those that they should be intended to serve. So I, I think that, you know, it's a great time for us to just step back and think about how we can create community. Even in this, this time of, of, of being in community from a virtual perspective, it still gives us um, a, a sense of perspective of how to really engage with all, with, within our communities. I would, I would piggyback off that um, and say that, I mean, it's, it's difficult now in the times of COVID. I think, you know, the, the tendency sometimes to become more insular um, and that's, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, really, it is about um, getting off of our campuses. A lot of times a college campus can be uh, an intimidating place, particularly if we're talking about first generation students and families. Um, so how do we, uh, what, what is our presence in, in the community, churches, mosques, um, you know, what is our presence uh, at community-based events, uh, even at the protests? Uh, you know, I, I, I applaud the, our incoming president, um, uh, McAllister. She, one of her first initiatives that she, after arriving in Minnesota, was to participate in a, a a march organized by local clergy. Um, and so thinking about things like that, right, are our, our, our institutions represented in these justice-based movements and what, and what does that look like? How so? Um, are, they, are we even part of organizing gatherings, vigils, you know, these kinds of things I think would, would speak highly to, um, to various communities. Thank you all. We're running up against time here. I don't think there was additional questions. If anyone had more questions they wanted answered, please uh, submit them to the Microsoft form. We will create a space to make sure we get those answered. If they're specific to one of our panelists, we will make sure the panelists get the question and we get an answer back to you all. Um, I just want to thank you all again for participating in our um, higher education, Office of Higher Education Public Engagement Call. Uh, I look forward to us continuing this discussion, continuing the work on racial equity within higher education. Um, and I hope to hear and see, or excuse me, hear <laughs> uh, many of you again, or um, see that you participate in our future calls. Uh, once again, there will be an email sent out with the recording of this call um, and information that was shared on this call, along with reminders about uh, next week's call. Uh, thank you all, uh, our panelists, once again, for participating. Thank you, Dr. Lazinski, Dr. Burnett, uh, Narita Hughes, Director Dees. We appreciate you, um, and thanks.